Welcome to episode 169 of the Various Assembly Podcast. I am your host, Matt Harmon, joined live from the Vault Studio, the beautiful campus of Grace College and Theological Seminary, by my good friend, my colleague, my co-host, and the man who is finally healthy, John Scott Sloat. I'm fairly healthy, I'd say. Well, I mean, this time of year, no one's 100%. It's yeah. like late in a in a football season. Nobody's 100%. Everybody's got little dings and nicks and aches and pains. So you're mostly healthy. I'm mostly healthy, yeah. yeah. I think I'll get through today's episode without coughing. Lord willing. We'll see, though. Yes. Yes. Uh, so um, we are recording on a cold – Cold March, March Monday morning. Monday morning, yeah. Yes, we are in the doldrums of late March, early April here. But it does feel like spring is about to to burst, well, doesn't ye- it? Yesterday we got a teaser, right? Mm-hmm. Yesterday was nice. I've got flowers up in my yard now. Yeah, yeah. We've got a tree next to our garage that bl- is always like the sign for us. Like when it blooms and it only – it blooms into flowers for like – a week to 10 days mm. and then the flowers fall off and then the leaves come up. But that's sort of like the sign of, OK, spring is really here. Yeah. So – and also with the time change, obviously, it stays light later. Isn't that nice? It is nice. It is nice. Though I don't enjoy necessarily driving to campus for my 8 a.m. class when it's still dark out. Yeah, that's true. Not a fan. But – um yeah, so uh, you're back from your travels. You were in I am. Ohio and Pennsylvania last week. I am, yep. Drove all the way across both states, Ohio, Pennsylvania, got into Philadelphia and flew back. Met with people along the way, right. of course. I didn't just drive for the heck of driving <laughs> and flying back. Yeah. But. Yes. Uh, were you pulled over by any police? Because I hear Pennsylvania, in my own experience, Pennsylvania can be a little bit dicey in terms of – Lower speed limits and a little bit more enforcement. Yeah. And Ohio, you get on the turnpike in Ohio. It is like – It's like the Autobahn. It it is. It's like an open road. (laughs) You know, it feels like there's plenty of room. You can can see for miles. Pennsylvania is very much like dipping in and out of mountains, going into tunnels. It feels a bit more like you're on a roller coaster. Yeah. uh, Where Ohio feels more like you're on a drag strip maybe. That's right. Um, so you're you're just you're just flying. And so, what kind of ride did you have for this? I mean, what what, what were you able to rent? So so I went so I rented a one way car right. from Fort Wayne to Philly. Dropped it off at Philly, flew back, and I get to the rental car counter at the Fort Wayne airport, and I asked the guy. He goes, "All right, so I got a Ford Explorer for you." I was like, you "Got anything more fun?" <laughs> and he goes, "Oh yeah, I do." And he named three muscle cars. And he, I said, which one would you take? He goes, take the Dodge Challenger. OK. And so I shot across in a two-door muscle car that was very cool. <laughs> um, so cool, in fact, that as I'm driving down uh, the turnpike in Ohio, a guy pulled up next to me and told me to roll down my window and he wanted to race. <laughs> At which point I looked I, – I, I didn't – I just sort of waved him on and I started thinking like I use cruise control. You know, I <laughs> I am an old man driving down the road. I set it to five over and just go. Um, but but yeah, he went – and then I got to like the middle of nowhere, Pennsylvania. Yeah. And everybody came up to me. Just, if I was in a parking lot somewhere, that's a nice ride. Where would you get that? And I had to explain it's a rental. I had to explain that I work for a non-for-profit. I, had to exp- <laughs> I then have to explain – that it's a free upgrade and I did not pay extra right. on my not-for-profit's dime yes. in order to get the car. Yes. That's that's good to clarify since your boss, uh, Nathan from Winona Lake, does yeah. listen to the program. Yes. Yes. No, I do not pay for upgrades. OK. Um, <laughs> I just to, asked for them. Did you have to explain it to anybody that you met with? Like, oh, look at you. You're coming to ask me for money and look at the e- ride you're pulling up. Every in. single one of them. <laughs> every single one of them. I have to apologetically make a joke about it and yeah. tell them. Yeah. I guess I did choose that car, but I asked for the free upgrade and they just gave it to me. Gotcha. Okay. All right. Well, yeah. What color was it? 
It was like a deep red, almost maroon. Of okay. Um, it was very cool. Yeah. It was. It was. It was fun to drive. And okay, be honest. Were there any moments where you took the cruise control off and kind of let it run a little bit? Uh, when when I have to pass people, yeah. absolutely. Okay. Like if I have to pass a truck or something like that, yeah. absolutely. You you bounce it up to you know eighty miles an hour and you lean on that pedal a little bit and you let it zip. Okay. All right. You let it roar. Okay. Felt good. <laughs> if you would like to get in touch with the show and uh, explain to John your own preferences when it comes to muscle cars and what he should rent next time. Yeah. You can find us on Twitter at VNS Pod. Email the show, various and sundry podcast at gmail.com. We're on Facebook. We're on YouTube. And we would love for you to leave a five-star rating and a review on whatever platform you access the show. And I'm starting to get free upgrades. So if you have recommendation on cars that I should go with, yeah, let me know. Okay. Absolutely. Let's do it. All right, John, let's talk a little sports here. Um, obviously, the big story, March Madness. We are down to our final four. Wild. Uh, arguably the craziest uh, tournament yeah, the highest seed is a four, I believe. Yes. I think there's a four, two fives. And a nine. And a nine. Uh, that might be the highest total ever, like if you add them all together. I think someone was telling me maybe 2011 was higher. Well, because did, that year George Mason at, a, at 11? as an 11 or a 12. Yeah, I can't yeah. Remember. And so that, that helps inflate the numbers sure, a little bit. Sure, sure. But nine. Yeah. I mean, getting to a point where – have you heard of Florida Atlantic? I have, but just because of – well, yeah, because of basketball. OK. So, yeah, it's um, – I mean, so Florida Atlantic, one of their best players is a guy named John L. Davis. Um, and he went to high school at Gary 21st Century here in Gary, Indiana. Oh, OK. And so um, I watched him play in high school a few times. Did you coach against? No, thankfully. OK, OK. Thankfully. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> would not have gone well. Um, that, that dude was a bucket. So, um, so yeah. So the final four is set. We've got Florida Atlantic. We've got UConn. We've got Miami, and we've got San Diego State. Now, San Diego State has had a good squad for for a while, but never broken through to this. Point. That's right. That's yep. right. They've always been a first, second round exit. It feels like to me. Yeah. Um, UConn. Traditional power, but – Has had been, some down years. It's been a few years since they've been uh, this good. That's correct. And uh, Miami. I don't think they've – have they ever reached the Final Four? That I'm not sure about. OK. I'm surprised they have a basketball team. I thought they were just football. <laughs> yes. And so we got two from – because Florida Atlantic is obviously in Florida. Yes. Miami, yeah. also obviously in Florida. San Diego State, California. California. Yeah. And then UConn. That's wild. I mean, we're talking sunshine, coastal cities other than Yukon. Yukon. Yeah. Uh, did you catch the end of the um, San Diego State? I did not. Game? No, no, I did not. Okay, obviously a con- controversial ending there. Um, did you see any of the any of the highlights of that? Nope. Okay. So, score was tied. One of the San Diego State players uh, drove the lane. Took a shot. They called a foul on the Creighton kid guarding him. And it was one of those where it's like, well, I suppose by rule, <laughs> that's a foul. Yeah. But. In they, a cru- crucial moment here. They weren't calling the game that way for the whole game. Mm. And so, see, I'm not someone who's like, oh, you. it has to be so obvious. Like, a foul is a foul. Like, it. You just got to call it the same way whether it's the first half or the second half, whether it's the first two minutes or the last two minutes. All you want as a coach and as a player is consistency. So yeah. you know this is what they're calling. This is not what they're calling. And so it's not that that I'm advocating for don't call that foul there. I'm saying if it wasn't a foul in the first half, don't call it there either. Yeah. Like just be consistent about how you're officiating the game because players and coaches adjust over time yeah. to how the game is being officiated. And he hit his shots and, and won the game. Made one. Mm. Missed the first one. So you can imagine all that pressure oh, yeah. sitting on him. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so that was uh, interesting. And then uh, 
Yeah. We should check the bracket. Have you checked the bracket standings for the for the podcast I, here? I have. So out of 38 entries, no one has their champion left. Yeah. And there's only two teams that have a team in the final four. There's only two brackets that have a team in the final four left. Yes. Do you know who those are? Um, no, I didn't. I was more looking for uh, that they that it existed because I wasn't sure it, it did. But Yes, it does. Um, who, who are they? Uh, well – so basically, if UConn wins their final four game, the champion of the bracket is going to be – oh, I lost place there. It's going to be Trenton. Oh, man. And then my son Jake will finish second. If, if UConn if, wins. If UConn wins. If UConn doesn't win, then the standings will remain the same basically and it will be Joseph who will win the competition. Do you know who Joseph is? I don't. OK. We're going to have to figure that out. Joey Bag of Donuts. That's his uh, Ove, bracket name. Ove Donuts. Ove Donuts. OK. So yeah. So that's where it stands. Man. And Absolutely sh- insane. What was funny is um, if Texas would have won yesterday – Mm-hmm. You know who would have won the bracket competition? If Texas would have won out. No, I don't know. My wife. Oh, really? <laughs> <laughs> so she was all fired up before the Texas game. She's like, I can win this. <laughs> and so then she begins to say, OK, well, I, I have all of your books. So getting a signed copy of your book means nothing to me. So you know what she wanted? She wanted it on the podcast. She wanted it on yeah. the podcast. Oh, well. That's – yeah. So I, I – I finished in 19th place. I think I was 26th. Yeah. So we did not have a good showing nope, this year, you nope, and I. No, we did not. We did not. Mm. So um, I have to imagine that the that the ratings will be poor for the Final Four and the championship. Because there's not a blue blood. There's not a blue blood. Other here. than sort of UConn. Yeah. Which kind of stands in for – that stands in for like a northeast, like like New York City yeah, sort suppose. of team. I suppose. But yeah, I, I'm, I'm guessing those ratings will be down. Like it's crazy to think you could have a final uh, – well, in any of these teams with the – like you said, with the exception of UConn, there's really no tournament history with those other three teams I think of, it, of, any, of any success. It's great. I, I think it's great for the for the uh, for the fan. Yeah, I don't know that it brings the casual fan in. You think you need a Christian Leitner to hate? In there? I think I think you need a big player, and I think you need a uh, a, uh, a brand name. Mm. I think I don't know. Um, by the way, I don't know if we mentioned this last week, but uh, Rick Patino. Did we talk about this on the podcast? I last think week? that might have broke after we recorded, but he's where's he going now? He is joining St. John's. That's right. That's right. Um, did we talk about that in the pod last week? We might have. We may have talked about it the next day, maybe. That could have been. I don't remember. I don't know. I, I have a hard enough time remembering what the yeah. rest of my day is going to take. Gonna well, happen I think it was last week. We talked about AI last week, didn't we? Yes. And then we talked about how Turnitin, the, the sort of plagiarism mm-hmm. software, does not have a way to detect um, – Yeah. Uh, way to detect. AI-generated content. That's right. And okay. then I think it was the next morning, Tuesday morning, I woke up, saw that I had an email from Turnitin and it was rolling out their beta yeah. uh, uh, detecting AI-generated yep. text. And I saw – did you watch the little video that – I did not, Where, where no. the guy explains – it kind of shows an example of here's what I wrote. Um, I wrote this – Here's what ChatGPT wrote and then kind of ran it through the system and it shows like, yep, that's OK. That's clearly AI generated. And then it ha- and then he did a paragraph where it was – I changed some words and some phrases but basically took what Ch- ChatGPT gave me hmm. and it highlights it as a maybe. Like it gives you a like, this is a little suspicious but we can't be confident that it was AI generated. Yeah. So hmm. it looks promising. That's great. So. Anyway, back to sports here. Uh, NBA regular season is very close to being over. Playoffs yep. probably start next week. Is that right? Ish. 
I think that's right. Yeah. Um, Knicks are a five seed. They'll yeah. take on the Cavs. Yep. Yeah, that looks. I think that looks like it's pretty solidly locked in. Did you see um, in terms of actual standings? Yeah, the Knicks have two games on the Nets, uh, and then the 76ers have two games on the Cavaliers. Yeah, so. so that looks like that's pretty set in stone. I think. Well, and there's a there's a pretty big gap. Like the the Cavs are five and a half games ahead of the Knicks. So there's no way that's flipping. No, 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 no. I mean, the Cavs are going to have the home court advantage there. Uh, looks like, what, six games left in the season? So I I suppose theoretically it's possible, but incredibly sure. unlikely. Um, yeah, and then in the West, um, again, you've still got that log jam between fourth and, let's see, uh, 11th, basically. Well, 4th and yeah, fourth and 10th. So the Suns are in 4th place, and they are only two and a half games ahead of 10th place uh, Oklahoma City. Who's on the Oklahoma City Thunder right now? Do you, I don't know that I can name a player. I don't know that I can either. Um no, uh, I think what's interesting is Dallas has dropped. Yeah, out they're of the, out of it. As of now, they're out of it. Now they're only, they're only a game back. They would be a game back of yes, so they're a game back at the Thunder uh, to get into the play-in tournament. Um, yeah, just a weird. Which is weird after the Kyrie trade. You would. Yeah, but I think I don't know that he and Luca have played a lot together at this point so far. Yeah, but. It'll be weird. I think I think the playoffs will be pretty wide open. Oh yeah. Um, and then World Baseball Classic update. Since this happened after we recorded last week, Japan beat the United States in the championship game. Which, by the way, I was in my hotel room trying to watch it, and it was on FS1, which my hotel room did not get. Mm. So I was not able to able to watch. Uh, it ended about the most perfect way possible. I didn't see how it ended. Oh, oh. So uh, Mike Trout, sort of the American, mm-hmm. widely considered the one of the best baseball players yeah. for the United States. Uh, two outs, Mike Trout up to bat. And who did the, who did the Japanese bring in to close out the game? Uh, probably Shohei. They brought in Mike Trout's teammate, Shohei Otani, yeah. and he struck him out wow. to end the World Baseball Classic. What a moment. There you go. There you go. Two of the world's best on a team that can't go anywhere. <laughs> That's right. That's right. Speaking of going somewhere, we need to move on, right? Sounds good. So our topic for today is reading the Bible the way Jesus did. Okay. That's what we decided. Sounds good. In one of our high-level planning meetings. Yeah, at Alpha Dining. Yes. Here on campus. That's right. That's right. So, um, yeah, let's uh, let, let's just kind of start with why is this issue even controversial? Why is this not a no-brainer? Or what is controversial about the claim that you should read the Bible the way Jesus read it? Well, I mean, I think anytime you're talking about a religious text and how to interpret, how to read it, I think there's always um, – uh, going high level here, there's always a variety of ways to go after it, to, to think about how to read it. Um, do you read it in light of something else? Do you read it on the immediate context only? Do you write it in light of the larger uh, group of writings? You know, you know, ha, ha, what framing device do you use to read this? Mm-hmm. Um, so I, I think anytime you're talking about reading a religious text, um, that conversation is always an important one to have. And so I I do think there are a lot of Christians that want to frame it a little bit differently than how I think you and I would, right? There's Mm -hmm. there's, um, how Jesus reads the Bible and particularly the Old Testament is, in my opinion, different than uh, some pastors in the way they they want to read the Old Testament. I I mean – and and for example, uh, growing up in a church – growing up in – Church, oftentimes the Old Testament was sort of these moral tales, right? Where, where goodness, I read 
uh, uh, Daniel in the Lion's Den. This is about, hey, be, be courageous. You know, uh, be, re- rely on God in the midst of terrible circumstances and mm-hmm. God will take care of you. You know, that, that was sort of the moral tale coming out of that. And that's, that's what I thought the Old Testament was for, was for these like moral cautionary tales. Yeah. I don't necessarily think that's the way Jesus read the Old Testament. I don't think that's the only way he read it. I do think there are elements of that in that. I do think Jesus and the New Testament writers do draw out moral lessons from different Old Testament uh, accounts for sure. But uh, I would say it's probably not even the primary way they read it. Um, And and ultimately, I think part of the – as I try to think about how how do you frame this issue so people can grab onto it – I would start by saying um, it seems as though when Jesus interprets the Old Testament, he goes beyond what the intended meaning of the human author suggests or Mm -hmm. indicates. I'm trying to frame that very neutrally without sort of tipping my hand which direction. Uh, Sure. Sure. But I think that's a fair way of probably framing that to say that that if you read what the Old Testament author communicates and then you see what Jesus – how Jesus interprets uh, the text and as well as the apostles after him, uh, at least a few times, I'd say Mm -hmm. maybe even often you go, huh, I don't know that a straightforward reading of that Old Testament text would get me – there. So do you have an example or some, a passage that you naturally think of from the New Testament where Jesus or perhaps one of the apostles goes, hey, here's this text from the Old Testament. Here's how I'm interpreting it. And you're like, oh, that doesn't seem to line up. Mm-hmm. So, uh, I mean, one one of the more obvious examples in my mind is in Matthew 2 where uh, Matthew lays out um, – after the birth of Jesus, you know Herod the Great is trying to eliminate uh, all of the all of the recently born boys in Bethlehem. So uh, Joseph and Mary and the and and Jesus flee down to Egypt, and they remain there until Herod dies, mm-hmm. and then they come back out of Egypt. And so uh, Matthew two fifteen. Uh, Matthew notes something like, this happened to fulfill uh, what what was written in the prophet, out of Egypt I called my son. Like, hmm, okay. And you realize, oh, that's Hosea 11.1. 1. Let's go back and look at Hosea 11.1. 1. And you see, that's not a direct promise. It's a historical description of what happened to Israel. So in in the Exodus. In the Exodus, mm-hmm. yes. And so Matthew looks back at a historical description of what happened to Israel being brought out of Egypt. And he says, Jesus coming out of Egypt and into the land fulfills that. You go, <laughs> I didn't realize there was something to fulfill there. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> this, this seems to just be a description of what happened, exactly. not necessarily looking forward. Exactly. Uh, and so I think you've got – uh, that is an example. You know, another example is uh, in Matthew 12 where um, Jesus is asked for a sign and he basically says, the only sign you're getting is the prophet Jonah. And he says um, essentially, you know, just as Jonah spent three days and three nights in the belly of the fish, so also the son of man will spend three days and three nights in the depths of the earth. <laughs> and that the men of Nineveh will rise up at the judgment and condemn this generation because they repented and you guys aren't. <laughs> and you're like... Don't remember that reading, Joseph. I remember a plant. I remember... <laughs> I remember him being swallowed by a fish. I remember him preaching. But like Jesus seems to look at that and goes, that's pointing to me. Mm-hmm. That's anticipating what I'm about to do. Uh, and so where is he getting that? And I think some people just say, well, he's God. He can do what he wants essentially with Jesus, scripture. Jesus is a special character yeah. obviously and, and you know does as he pleases. Right. Yeah. So 
Um, but I don't think that accounts for what the what the evidence of the New Testament itself does when it comes to um, how we should read the Old Testament because I think Jesus himself instructs his disciples to read it that way also. And so I think um, the most significant text where you see that uh, is um, in Luke 24. So this is after the resurrection, which, by the way, in Luke's uh, gospel, one of the interesting things is he wants to stress the proper way to read the Old Testament so much so that he tells two stories related to the proper way to read the Old Testament um, that none of the other gospel writers have. Hmm. So that tells you right there, Luke wants to make sure you understand this as a consequence of the resurrection. And so uh, we'll pick up in Luke 24. What verse? Uh, verse 44. Okay. And we'll go through verse 49. Uh, so this is Jesus has appeared to the disciples uh, hiding behind closed doors in Jerusalem. Then he said to them, these are my words that I spoke to you while I was still with you, that everything written about me in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms must be fulfilled. Side note, that's a way of referring to the entirety of the Old Testament, right, the right, three right. portions of the Jewish uh, breakdown of the Old Testament. Then he opened their minds to understand the scriptures. That's important. <laughs> and said to them, thus it is written that the Christ should suffer and on the third day rise from the dead and that repentance and forgiveness of sins should be proclaimed in his name to all nations beginning from Jerusalem. You are witnesses of these things. And behold, I am sending the promise of my Father upon you, but stay in the city until you are clothed with power from on high. So there's a lot we could talk about in there, but uh, the big takeaway is what Jesus is saying there is, in essence, this is what the message of the Old Testament is about. It's about the Christ suffering. Mm -hmm. It's about the Christ um, rising from the dead on the third day and repentance and forgiveness being proclaimed to all the nations. That's his summary of the Old Testament. <laughs> and it's striking because that uh, verse 46 there begins with uh, Jesus said to them, thus it is written. And almost every place in the New Testament where you get a thus it is written, you get a direct quotation from the Old Testament, but not here. Here you're getting a summary of the entire Old Testament. Yeah. And so one of the reasons I think this passage is so important is it is Luke explaining – well, ultimately it's Jesus explaining, Luke recording that this is how you're supposed to read the Old Testament. You're supposed to read every part of it as in some way contributing to this basic narrative of the Christ suffering, rising from the dead, and repentance and forgiveness being proclaimed to the ends of the earth. That's what the Old Testament is about. Every piece of it in some way relates to that basic plot summary, we could call it that. Hmm. And so I think um, to me that's one of the decisive – um, sort of summary statements of how Jesus read the Old Testament and how he's now instructing his followers to read the Old Testament. So let, let's go in a little bit. So um, can, can you give me an example from the Old Testament that isn't mentioned in the New Testament mm -hmm. where you go to the Old Testament and say, here's a passage that's seemingly about something in Israel's history or, or some sort of prophecy or something like that that points us to uh, what we see in Luke here, that uh, this Old Testament passage is about um, Christ suffering, Christ rising from the dead, and proclaiming uh, the gospel to the nations. Mm -hmm. can, can, do you have an example of that to just, to just put a little bit more meat yeah. uh, on, the, on the sort of theoretical here? I mean, in one sense, you can see um, that's the whole Joseph narrative in Genesis 37 to 50, that when you think about uh, – you know, Joseph is left for dead by his brothers and presents 
I mean, they trade they they trade him into slavery, but essentially he's dead to them. Sure. And basically, tell his dad, uh, we found his cloak. It's got this blood. Oh no! Something must have happened to him. I'm just putting two and two together <laughs> here, right. but right. So, f- as far as um, as far as Jacob's concerned, he's dead. Joseph is dead. And so, um, and then Joseph goes off into Egypt. Obviously, um, he is mistreated, wrongly accused of mm-hmm. being inappropriate with Potiphar's wife, uh, imprisoned for that, and um, you know, in one sense, just sort of forgotten about until Pharaoh has a dream, mm-hmm. and Joseph goes from the depths of that prison to being exalted. As the second in command in all of Egypt. Well, that's kind of like a resurrection if you yeah, ask yeah, me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And what happens as a result of his leadership, you've got the nations coming to him and being rescued from famine because of his wise actions and planning. Mm-hmm. And so to me, can you read it just as, oh, yeah, God – you know what you what God, what you meant for evil, God meant for good. Yes, that's true. And Genesis does that. And Genesis does yeah. that. But when you look at the when you root that into the larger context of what happened before in Genesis of God promising a serpent crusher and of God promising through Abraham to bless all the nations of the earth, you can see how Joseph even before you get to the New Testament, can be understood as, well, what we need is a Joseph-like ruler, Mm -hmm. one who is able to wisely rule over not just God's people, but ultimately the nations as well. Mm -hmm. And so I think there's just a richer level of application that comes out of that as well. Um, not to say that it's inappropriate to say, okay, well, in terms of application, um, we should believe that God, um, what other people mean, mean for evil, God means for our eternal good. Yes, that's true. Yeah. Absolutely. But it's more than that because what it points to is the reality that um, the ultimate person who suffered did so – as a result of our sins mm-hmm. and as a result of that of, – as a result of his suffering, he is able to provide something far greater than salvation from famine. Mm-hmm. He provides a salvation from our sins and from our bondage to sin and that that salvation extends not just to a certain ethnic group but ultimately to all the nations of the mm. And so I think it, it's, it's a way of making sure you read the – Old Testament canonically within its larger redemptive historical and canonical context. So I think that's one example. That yeah, that no, that's about. great. Um, if I, you know, for me, when I came across this idea, I think I think I was in seminary. I think I was in your New Testament theology class. Which, let's be real, your New Testament theology class is basically this topic on steroids, <laughs> right? Is that is that a fair assessment? That's one fair way of looking yeah. at it. Yeah, that's <laughs> um, yeah, true. Um, but a combination of doing this and then in the midst of that class, we went to the Gospel Coalition that year yeah. where this was the topic, mm-hmm. preaching Christ from the Old Testament. Yep. Uh, and, and we can put it in the show notes, but I'd encourage everybody to go back and listen to those sermons, listen to those workshops from that because that was, yeah. for me, was incredibly uh, formative. Yes. Um, and And – one of the better gospel coalitions out there, I, 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 I think. think so. is, is that a fair statement? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I still remember uh, Keller did Exodus 15. That's right. Yep. And uh, Carson did uh, uh, Getting Excited About Melchizedek. I'll never. One of the great titles <laughs> of all time. <laughs> um, and Keller introduced him and laughed about the title yeah. while introducing yeah. him. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> oh my goodness! Uh, Alistair Begg did Ruth there as well. Yeah, yeah. Um, and I imagine all of those are archived on the on the Gospel oh yeah Coalition website. Uh, Bullmore did did Mike speak? Did he speak at that one? He I think he, I think he did. He might have yeah. But I, I mean, all of them were just were just really really good. Mm-hmm. 
That'd be one resource I would throw out there. Yeah. If somebody's beginning to be like, okay, I want to start thinking this way. I want to start reading my Bible this way. Mm-hmm. Where do you point them? Because, I mean, there is, like, I, I think I'd be remiss without saying, there's opportunities to abuse uh, this sort of interpretation as oh, well. Oh, 100%. 100%. Um, I think where, so if you're, I would start this way. If you just want to put sort of like, wade into the water a little bit, not mm-hmm. necessarily jump into the deep end and swim around and all the issues and that sort of stuff. I think one of the easiest ways to jump in is uh, David Murray's book, Jesus on Every Page, 10 Simple Ways to Seek and Find Christ in the Old Testament. Mm. I think it's really user-friendly. Yeah. I think it's written at a good level um, and is really – and it's actually one of those books that – I think it kind of flies under the radar a little bit. Yeah, it does. Um, even though it's cr- – I think it's a crossway book. Maybe it's not. I can't remember. But, um, you know, there are other books out that we'll put in the show notes that are more in-depth and deal with more detail. But I think that one's a good user-friendly – let me just kind of see what this is all about and how that works in some practical ways that I can um, do this for myself. Yeah. That would be the, probably the one I'd highlight out of that list in particular. Um, if you're more on the academic end of things, there's a recent book by uh, edited by Brian Tabb and Andrew King called Five Views of Christ in the Old Testament where you get the breadth of the academic discussion about is this legitimate? How do we do it? What are some things to avoid, be careful about kind of thing? Um, that would be the other end of the spectrum of like I want to get a deep dive into how do different people see this and what are the disagreements across those perspectives. Okay. Yeah, and that's a brand. That's a brand new book because that series, because that's the Counterpoint series, is that it right? Is, yeah. There was an older edition that was similar to that. Yeah, not as good. Not as good as this. No, it only had three views, and it was one of those books where I read and I go, I don't, I don't, my view's not in there. <laughs> and this <laughs> and one, I, and I don't hold a view that I think is like this especially novel. It's just none of those are like, yeah, not quite, not quite. Uh, this this one, I'd say the essay by uh, Jason uh, Derushi. Um, Where's he at? Midwestern. Okay. Uh, I think his essay most closely reflects my view and is most persuasive to me. Okay. Well, I'd assume it would be if, if yeah. it is indeed if it is indeed yeah. your view. Um, Any anything else you want to you want to chat about on this on this topic? Let me just hit one more thing because sure. I, you know even if someone's like I'm not going to go pick up a book. Okay. Here's something that I found is remarkably helpful in trying to read the Old Testament. This way, um, if you read the Old Testament, look at the key figures mm-hmm. and all of them in some way either point forward to uh, – so if you take something good that they do, Christ is going to do something like that only perfectly and to a greater extent. Mm-hmm. And if there's something bad that they do, Christ is obviously not going to do the bad thing. Yeah, yeah. And so he's the better version of those things. Mm. And you can especially apply that even to uh, prophet, priests, and kings since yeah. those are the three kind of primary offices that Jesus holds. So every king you can look at, well, every king that does something good, Jesus is going to do something like that only better. Hmm. And every failure of the king is going to be paid for by the great king who rules in righteousness and never fails his people. Hmm. And the same for every prophet and every priest. That Even just that little little rubric there of what's the prophet or priest or king yeah. doing well? Jesus does something like that even better on a grander scale. What's he doing poorly or failing at? Jesus won't fail like that. And he'll actually pay the price for our failures in those areas. Yeah. Something like that can be really helpful. That, that's, that's so helpful. Absolutely. All right, John. We should probably move on. You ready? Yep. Time now for This Day in Sports History. Okay. Today is March 28th. Where is the – where's the month of March going, man? It's almost gone. I don't know. Growing up – and let me know if you've had this experience. It always felt to me that March was the longest month of the year, that it seemed to take the most time. But this month has flown by. I think in our academic context now, when you throw a spring break in there at the beginning of it and – yeah, to me that I think helps accelerate it a little bit yeah. in my experience. But I'm going to be honest. April's just I'm going to make the disclaimer here. Since you have an April birthday, one of my sons has an April birthday. Yep. Well, the Masters is coming up. My of mother-in-law course. has a <laughs> yes. 
John will appreciate that reference. I know he will. Um, yeah. I almost texted him when I saw commercials this yeah, last week. Yeah. And uh, so my mother-in-law has an April birthday. Despite all those great things, April is probably my least favorite month of the year. Really? Why yeah. is that? I think the weather is just typically so dreary. Yeah. And you like you're ready for spring. You're waiting for it. You get these little glimpses. But then most days are like 50 degrees and overcast with some drizzle. Yeah. Until you get to May. And then you really feel like, OK, spring is kind of finally here. Yeah. Oh, yeah. So um, that's why I'm not a big fan of the month of April, despite the lovely birthdays that are in. And, and your wife's birthday. My is wife's there, so. my wife's birthday is in April as well. Um, also kind of right around the Masters, interestingly. Um, but uh, yes, yes. Easter doesn't do it for you. Uh, popping into <laughs> April. That doesn't make it a favorite month for you. Do you like how I did that there? Yeah, that was that was so you're saying you're anti-Easter, Doc? What? So, so yeah. against the resurrection. Is yeah. that what I'm to understand? <laughs> against Good Friday as well? Yeah. Um, yeah. Anyway, uh, March 28th, 2023, where has the month gone? There's where we were. Um, so today, uh, 1957, the first national curling championship is held. I assume that's United States national curling. I, I assume so. Um, you know, curling doesn't get enough attention. We talk about it once every four years. Once the Winter Olympics come around yeah. and people get the brooms out and they're, you know, doing that, whatever they do to brush away debris on the ice. And there's this little spike of interest. Googling goes up on, oh, yeah. on curling. I'm sure the Fort Wayne Curling Club gets an influx of people wanting to yeah, curl. And that's a real thing. I bet. It yeah. is a real thing. Yes. Uh, so, yeah, 1957. Uh, 1972, uh, Wilt Chamberlain. Plays his last uh, pro basketball game. It feels like we could name this podcast like <laughs> Various Sundry and Wilt Chamberlain. <laughs> it feels Because like we it. talk about Wilt like almost every yeah. episode. Yeah, it feels like it. Um, 1990, Michael Jordan scores 69 points. The fourth time he scores 60 points in a game. Yep. That's, that's, like, that's like peak, right in that window of like peak first career Jordan. Yeah, when he wasn't winning. Yeah, well, I think they won their first in 91. They went nine, did they go 92 or 91, 92, 93? He retired. 94, 95 was the Rockets and then he came back in 96. Yeah. They won 96, 97, 98. I think mm-hmm. that's how it went. So, I think you're right. Um so Earl, first career Jordan where he was just freakishly athletic and uh explosive, dynamic to watch. Yep. Uh 1990 US President George H W H.W. Uh, Bush posthumously awards Jesse Owen the Congressional Gold Medal. Yes. We've talked about Jesse Owen a few times. I think so. Uh, on, yeah. this, uh, on this podcast, the 36 Olympics, obviously kind of rubbing it in the face of Adolf Hitler in Berlin. Oh, yeah. About, an, about a black man being so athletically superior to his Aryan mm-hmm. athletes. And a, and a Buckeye, right? Yes. Um, uh Okay, so uh, Jesse Owen getting the congressional gold medal. What took so long to get the congressional gold That's medal? That's a great question. I'm not sure. And why in 1990 and not uh, the 30s or 40s? Well, I imagine they had other they had other things going on. They were the 30s, busy 40s. holding the world together. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, all right. Uh, tw- 2007, Sri Lankan. I know when I see the word Sri Lankan <laughs> there, I know this is going to be something I can't pronounce. Yes, probably. Uh, 2007, Sri Lankan cricket. Fast bowler, uh, Lashith Malanga. How'd I do? Not bad. Okay. As far as I can tell. Uh, produces an unprecedented sequence of four wickets and four balls as South Africa scrambles to a one-wicket Super 8 ICC World Cup win in, ooh, uh, Guyana? I think so. So – Did you understand anything in that sentence besides the geographical references? Um. I did not understand scrambles to a one wicket super eight ICC and the four wickets and four balls. I, I did not get either. I understand unprecedented. Uh, <laughs> Good. <laughs> uh, sequence, I also understood. Yeah. Okay. But that's about it. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Uh, so the pickings were a little slim uh, for today. Do you have a preference? I think we should scratch off Wilt Chamberlain. We, we mentioned him enough. We also mentioned Michael Jordan quite a bit too. Yeah. Okay. So that leaves us with either – I feel like we've done Jesse Owens too. A couple times. Not as not as much as True. Wilt or Mike. 
I mean, I'm going to be honest. I'm kind of leaning towards Lassith Malinga. Lassith, just to put it in the show title? Yeah. Okay, yeah, that's fine. Okay. Cricket it is. But we're, we're having an expert on to explain cricket to uh, us. Lord some... willing, we're working on it. Yeah. I, right, I w- that's, that's, on the, that's on the to-do list? I mean, yes. We, I, I am hopeful that our summer read – and our interview with that author that he will be able to um, – Can we do a second bonus episode that's just cricket material? <laughs> OK. Uh, we'll have to – I'll have to see if he's up for that. OK. OK. Yes. OK. Uh, one thing you liked? Uh, we've already talked about the one thing I like, but I'm going to go with driving the Dodge Challenger yeah. crossroad across a segment of the United States. Yeah. That was a blast. The Great American Road Trip. Yeah, it was – Zipping around in that thing, it was it was awesome. Yeah. Did you get to take anybody for a ride with you in it? I did not. Okay. I did not. I offered my wife a ride around the block and she said, I don't care. So, <laughs> okay. Yeah. And then we're driving yesterday. I go, she goes, oh, that's an w- interesting looking car. I'm like, oh, yeah, that's – and I – this kind of model, this kind mm-hmm. of car. And she goes, how do you know that? I went <laughs> – how do you not know that? Right. <laughs> you see them all the time on the road. You know, yeah. you just read the little back of them and you know yeah. what they are. Yeah. So she does not care about cars. Yeah. I'm sort of a middle of the road person when it comes to knowing and being interested in cars. Uh, my son, John, though, very much into cars. Really? Yeah. I don't think I knew this and, about and he John. regularly um, – there's multiple car shows a year in, um, in the Indianapolis area where he lives. Oh, I bet. And he loves going to those. Hmm. So um, – he will. Uh, he he will gladly tell you about the different cars he got to see and how he would love to have them someday. So, nice. So, how about, how about yourself, Doc? My one thing I liked is uh, one of our chapel speakers last week, Mark Vrogup. I think that's how you say his last that's name. It's Dutch. challenging. Yeah. Uh, he is the lead pastor at College Park Church in Indianapolis, which is also where my son attends. Um, He came up and spoke in our uh, chapel on lament, and he's the author of a book, uh, Dark Clouds, Deep Mercy, which is excellent. Yeah. Uh, So uh, it was just very encouraging to – you know, you wouldn't think a message about lament, but, uh, you know, it just sort of hit me right where I was at at the point, at that Hmm. point when when, uh, he spoke and had a fun fun brief conversation with him afterwards because – I went up to introduce myself to him and to thank him for his ministry at College Park and how my son benefits from it. I'm walking up to him. I don't even get a chance to say hello. And he says to me, you must be John's dad. <laughs> so he, he could identify me as my son's father. Wow. Um, so, yes, that was that was a – that made me chuckle a little bit. So That's great. Yeah. yeah. That's so funny. Seems like a really – uh, really good guy. So I'm grateful for his ministry here yeah. and um, thankful that uh, we had him on camp. And then he did a – after he spoke in our undergrad chapel, he did a seminar for faculty and staff on how to help people going through suffering and how lament is mm. a helpful way of doing that and just some practical uh, suggestions on here's how you help someone – Learn how to lament yeah. using biblical laments as a pattern. I'm sad I was on the road for this. So it's very good. Um, I uh, lament that I was on the road yeah. for his, his I mean, you, being we sh- here. We could throw in a link. Let's do that. Let's throw in a link to the chapel service because it's, it's up on YouTube for Sh- a great chapel. should be. Yeah. Yeah. And um, yeah, it, and it, his book kind of lays out a lot of what he was talking about. Nice. As well. So. That is my one thing I liked. So we have talked March Madness. We have talked reading the Bible the way Jesus did. We have talked about the world-famous Sri Lankan cricket fast bowler Lassith Malinga. Lassith Malinga. We have talked about John driving a muscle car across Ohio and Pennsylvania. It was a blast. A good time. We've talked about uh, Mark Rogup. And his message in chapel. Insert Dutch last name here. Yes. Sort of a, yeah. So I think by definition, we have covered our various and sundry topics. And so all that's left to say is, until next time, 
the Lord bless you all real good. Later. 